How strongly do you agree with the following statement? If everyone is special, then no one is. In school, were you made to feel as though your intelligence level couldn't change? Did you think that the slow kids were just naturally not smart? These are just some of the questions that I posed to you all in a recent survey and questions I want to dive into deeper in this video. Recently, I've been thinking about my experience in school as a slow kid who eventually worked their way up the ranks into advanced placement courses in various academic honor societies such as Phi Beta Kappa, and as someone who has seen it all from remedial math to again high honor societies, I thought I'd share my experience and also see how you all felt about being labeled in school. So in the first part of this video, I'm going to go into my own academic history and how my internalization of these labels motivated me to work harder, but how that's not necessarily a positive thing. And how in reality, these labels fuel resentment, apathy, competition, and anxiety. In the second part, I'll get into the survey results to see how gifted programs and labels affected us as kids and later as adults. We'll get into how many students go undiagnosed with disorders such as ADHD and how those affect learning and behavior, as well as the intersections of race and class when it comes to being labeled as gifted or slow. And lastly, I'll talk about how dangerous these labels can be, especially when talking about the implication of who's born with raw talent and gifts and who's not and how maybe these academic labels as dictated by the school system really just work to separate who can be useful to the state and who can't. So without further ado, let's go. So for reference, I'm 28 years old and I graduated high school in 2013, so an entire decade ago. And when I was a kid, school just didn't come easy to me. From elementary school, I just really wasn't self-motivated and honestly really hated school because I was bullied a lot. Starting at age six, I was already self-conscious about what my peers thought of me and just tried my best to become invisible. I was, however, pretty good at drawing as it was something that I was genuinely interested in and an interest that was fostered at home. Put a pin in this for later. But when it came to academic subjects like math and reading comprehension, I was miserable. I was definitely slower than my peers in that it just took me longer to get things. And by the time multiplication and division was introduced in third grade when I was eight, I was really starting to fall behind. So the school's method of helping me and my other slower peers catch up was to pull us out of regular classes and go to a special classroom where we'd get extra time to do our times tables and do a lot of acrostic poems. For some reason, I remember doing a lot of acrostic poems. And honestly, at the time, I didn't realize what was happening and didn't think much of it. I actually really liked the smaller class size and more one-on-one -on -one time with the slow kid teacher. What I did realize, though, was that a lot of these other slow kids were my bullies. They also just happened to be the school troublemakers, the class clowns, the more defiant kids, if you will. Looking back, they clearly had behavioral issues that needed to be addressed, but weren't. I also now wonder if the teachers just put them in this program in order to just get them out of the main class because the teachers found them to be annoying. And when us slow kids made it to the fourth grade, when math class was now a separate period that was divided into three levels, basic, intermediate, and advanced, we were all put in the basic class. And I knew I had to get out of this class because I just had to get away from these kids. I was a bully target and being the dumb adopted Asian kid with no dad wasn't helping. So in fourth grade, with the help of flashcards, I was finally able to do my times tables at a pace that pleased the district and got out of the basic class and away from my bullies. And honestly, I felt pretty good about being in the average class with my friends. Fourth grade was also the beginning of the gifted programs. In my experience, we had two gifted programs, one for art and one for academic subjects. Some people were in both, but I was lucky enough to just be in the art one. Though honestly, being gifted in the art program gave me a lot of imposter syndrome as I always thought my peers were better than me and I felt like I was falling behind and that I didn't belong. I also wasn't allowed to draw what I wanted to, which is mainly Kim Possible fan art. As though my love of art was fostered at home, I was told I could only draw realistically and I couldn't really draw what I wanted to draw. Honestly, this made me give up something that I loved because I associated it with someone who made me miserable. As for the academic gifted program, to test into the program, I remember we did like some sort of IQ test where you had to complete puzzles and numbers and Sudokus for some reason. And ironically enough, many of my friends at the time were accepted into the academically gifted program. 
And I remember how they got to go on special field trips and how when they got pulled out of the class, it was a big deal, but for a different reason than when us slow kids got pulled out of the class. They also had this supposedly amazing teacher and all of the other teachers fawned over her. And even as a kid, I was like, I want that teacher too. Like, why can't she teach the rest of us? In all, the gifted kids and teachers were to be admired and envied, and I did envy them. I wanted to be them. I was a wannabe gifted kid, but in the end, I was labeled as slow and, you know, an anti-gifted kid or the furthest thing from what those special kids were. Fourth grade was tough and full of tears, but I finally made it to fifth grade and guess what? I was put back into the basic math class, even though I just thought I proved to these people that I could handle the average class. But upon reflection, I really did belong in a slower paced math class, but I just hated the people in the class and the label so much that I was trying to force myself into a class that wasn't for me. In middle school, I was consistently placed in basic classes, whether it be math or English, because of how I was evaluated in elementary school, and again, put in the same class with my bullies. I realize now as an adult, I partly resented those lower level classes, not only because of the label, you know, who wants to be called slow, but because in my mind, I was smarter than these closed-minded, racist, conservative bullies who outwardly hated me so much. I definitely was a little smug back then. I thought, you know, I'm not stupid like them, which looking back is pretty mean. Just because we all needed a little extra help didn't mean that we were bad kids. Them being racist towards me did make them bad kids, but them being supposedly stupid didn't make them bad or mean or wrong. And that's to say nothing of the outright ableism when it comes to students who have mental disorders that affect their ability to learn, like ADHD, or students who have ODD or oppositional defiant disorder and can't learn in a stereotypical public school classroom setting. But instead, these types of students were just simply called slow and shoved in a back classroom rather than being seen as individuals, each with, you know, their own issues that needed to be addressed. The slow label creates a stigma against kids who need to learn at a slower pace. Just because they can't achieve the standards the state sets for them doesn't mean that their needs should take a back seat. But because I internalized these labels so much as a kid and teen, I actually believe that these kids I shared classes with were intellectually inferior when in reality, they just took being called slow in a different way than I did, which was totally valid. Whereas I was motivated by being called slow and did everything in my power to prove the school and my teachers wrong, these kids rightfully just started to resent school School, turn on their peers and become defiant and apathetic. Which again is a very valid response and logical conclusion to come to when you've been called slow since you were eight because you failed an arbitrary IQ test and can't perform how the district demands. And honestly, I'm surprised I had so much confidence in my own abilities back then. I knew that I deserved more, that I deserved to be taken seriously academically, and I knew that I was capable when my teachers didn't. I'm proud of myself, but I also think that I was motivated to do well for the wrong reasons. Rather than being motivated to get into higher level classes because I genuinely wanted to learn, I was motivated by just wanting to get rid of the label and out of spite for the people around me so I could prove my teachers and district wrong. And finally, when I did make it to honors and advanced level classes, I did enjoy them. I thought they were intellectually stimulating, but I also was rewarded with a lot more homework that we should just be able to handle because we're advanced after all. Yay, now I get to be punished for liking history and English. Getting rid of a label isn't what should motivate us in school and into learning more and pushing ourselves because in the end, not only is this new label just a different set of pressures, but it also makes you turn against your peers. I looked down on the other slow kids even though I was a slow kid and the slow kids in turn resented the advanced and so-called gifted students because they're getting all these special resources when they're just forced into a dusty old back classroom and labeled delinquents. So in eighth grade, when the teachers were assigning us to our high school level classes, I requested to be put in, you know, an average history and English class because those were the subjects that I was genuinely interested in. And I was okay with spending another year in, you know, basic math and science class. However, my history and English teachers at the time denied my requests. So I had to override their decisions and advocate for myself to be 
put in regular or average classes in high school where I realized that they weren't much different from the basic classes or, you know, below average classes, you know, guess I really wasn't missing out on much. The only difference was that the students in these, you know, average classes had less behavioral and learning issues so the class could focus more on the subject at hand, you know, and go at a faster pace. That was about it. During my sophomore year of high school, I was taking advanced English and history, and in junior year, I was finally in an average level math and science class. And as someone who has seen it all as a former slow kid to someone who took four AP classes junior year, there's definitely a difference between the coursework and the classroom dynamic at every level. In more basic level classes, they move at a slower pace and give you a lot more busy work, mainly so you can stop bothering the teacher. Usually in slower paced classes, you have students that need help not just with the subject at hand, but who have trouble learning and focusing and tend to be more disruptive out of boredom or frustration, so the class gets interrupted a lot. I remember in my sophomore remedial chem class, there was a full-on blowout between one of the teachers and the students because of a cell phone, and basically it took the entire class to resolve that's all we did that day and almost every class was like that we were never able to focus on the lesson because a lot of the students were just over it we had an eight in the class but one wasn't enough and by sophomore year most of these kids were just sick and tired of school and the last thing they wanted to be in was remedial chemistry And I think these types of students are not only hindered because the school doesn't give, you know, enough aids and support, but also because of the label of slow and how that just helps fuel resentment for school and learning and how they see themselves in an academic setting. We're just told to believe that we were born slow and that there's nothing that we can do about it or change that. We're even dissuaded from overriding our teachers' decisions to be put in higher classes because if you fail, it's on you and you can't change back. In my high school, for example, the administrators actively tried to pressure me out of taking honors and advanced placement courses because those just weren't for me. And this reinforces this idea that your potential to learn and your ability to learn is something that's unchangeable and innate and something genetic. Your intelligence and your capability to learn is just something that's a part of you and determined at birth, not something you can achieve with hard work. And personally, I really freaking hate that. For a country like the US who prides themselves on hard work and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, the school system really encourages this idea of innate natural ability rather than emphasizing that with time, work, support, and dedication, you can become more apt at learning and grow your potential as a student and as a human being. In the end, 330 people filled out the survey, and I just wanna say thank you so much for your well put and thorough responses. So firstly, the demographics. Most people who filled out the survey were between 19 and 25 years old, and you all mostly graduated high school around the same time that I did, you know, within the last decade from 2011 to 2020. You guys are mainly from the US and went to US public high schools, but we also have some people from Mexico, Poland, South Africa, and the UK. And some of you went to charter schools as well as religiously affiliated private and public schools. When it comes to separating classes by academic level, most of you experienced that in elementary school alongside with the introduction of the gifted program, which is similar to my own experience. Most of you were also labeled as gifted or above average, and a small handful of you were labeled as slow. The majority of you also said that you felt jealous of the gifted kids, but a lot of you also cited that there was jealousy and competition within the gifted program itself. Some responses read, I was considered gifted, but I knew that I wasn't as gifted as the other kids, so that created some personal jealousy issues. I was in an out-of-gate, gifted, and talented education for three years in elementary. I wasn't jealous of gifted students, but I definitely felt inferior. I was advanced in my elementary school, but when I moved, I was not accepted into their gifted program. Was jealous when my younger sister got in, though. I wasn't stupid, just wasn't interested in school. My school made it very clear who was gifted and who wasn't. It would pit kids against each other. The majority of you answered no, that you didn't think the slower kids were just naturally not smart. Some of you even cited that you knew kids in the slow classes had learning disabilities like dyslexia or had ADHD, which makes it harder to learn in a classroom setting or didn't speak English as a native language. 
and thus weren't able to be taken seriously by the English speaking school system. I didn't think about what made students slow. I did know some had dyslexia, etc. I struggled in ways too with ADHD. Some, sure, others might have issues like dyslexia or are just bad test takers. Smart is also a loaded term. Academically inclined is better. I thought that learning was more difficult for them, which is why they were in a different class. It was a mix, some maybe, but I knew for sure some were quite smart, but say English was a second language, so their performance in every class suffered unfairly. Others had learning disabilities in a specific area that similarly held them back, slash got them labeled across the board, which definitely was my experience. If you weren't good in math, that basically labeled you as slow across the board, no matter what the subject was. On the other hand, the majority of you did think that in school, you felt as though your intelligence level couldn't change. Some responses read, yes, but IQ is bullshit. <laughs> Sometimes there are messages of, you're not good enough if you don't reach straight A's. However, you're good enough to try to get straight A's. Although I understand that it was used to motivate us and it worked, sometimes I felt like I'd never be good enough. They didn't make us feel that way, it was just implied. Grades were everything. Teachers give us a set of predictive grades before every official assignment, and then we got a new set after every test up until the final exams at GCSE and A level. Statistically, teachers tend to overpredict on average. But of course, once you factor in all the different biases, racial slash ethnic, socioeconomic class, mental condition, social skill, and personality, etc., then prejudice plays a big role in making certain students feel like they can't improve. I thought it was interesting how some of you pointed out in your responses to this question that you did feel this way, but more about yourself and not about others. This is something that I already touched on in my own personal academic experience that I definitely think was really integral to my own school system. This feeling as though, you know, you couldn't change who you were. The administrators actively tried to dissuade slow kids like me from taking AP and honors classes. And if the teacher you had didn't already think highly of you to put you in a higher level on their own, you had to go to the administration yourself and advocate for yourself. And this made me feel as though the school system already had us and our intelligence all figured out and that there was nothing you know you could do about it which was really demoralizing lastly most of you saw the label you were given as affecting you negatively yes whether i was given good grades or bad grades whether my teachers had high or low expectations i always felt bad just by nature of how the system operated the whole idea of grades and attainment really screwed with my self-image through my, my teen years even now, at 20 years old, there's still part of me that equates my A-level grades with my overall intelligence, even though I know it's BS. When I was younger, it affected me positively because I didn't get along with my classmates and it made me feel like I was good at something. It was okay if my social skills were bad because I was smart, but now that I'm in college, I'm scared of failure and not being good enough or not being enough, as intelligent as I was before. Some of you said it affected you both positively and negatively. Both, it made me see myself as smart slash hardworking. But after all the gifted programs and advanced classes, I ended up where everyone else kind of ends up. And that exceptionality that I was praised for seemed to just fade away as I got older. I felt quote unquote stupid as I got older after school because there was no way to distinguish myself from others. Positively in that it made me confident in my own abilities. Negatively in that it gave me false confidence. College kicked my ass. And others said that the label didn't have an effect on them. I didn't think it did. I was just okay being an extra help student because that's what I needed, extra help. And as a fellow extra help student, I really liked that response. So now we're going to go more deeply into patterns that I saw in the responses that I think are really important to highlight when reflecting on gifted programs and school labels like SLOW. Firstly, undiagnosed learning disabilities and mental disorders and how those types of students are set up to fail no matter what end of the spectrum they're on. So dyslexia is seen as a learning disorder, ADHD is seen as a developmental disorder, and autism spectrum disorder or ASD is a complex developmental condition involving persistent challenges with social communication, restricted interests, and repetitive patterns in behavior. And even though ADHD and autism spectrum disorder aren't explicitly labeled as learning disorders, all three of these disorders do affect learning in different ways. As one responder put it, I had undiagnosed autism and ADHD. It always took an effect on my ability to learn, which was something teachers exclusively blamed on me and my lack of desire to learn. 
To them, it was never about the subjects being taught or their ability to teach different students. It was just that I was too stupid and or lazy, and they just couldn't understand why I wasn't open to learning just like everyone else. It was very victim blamey, and especially when I was like 10 and under, teachers frequently took the opportunity to make an example out of me to other students, telling other students, this is what happens to you when you're lazy and don't want to learn, etc., right in front of me like I wasn't there. Another responder felt similarly. At my Christian school, they framed my struggles with ADHD as me being lazy and not caring enough, and that I was sinning and disobeying them. I'd feel guilty any time my mind would inevitably wander and I'd zone out. On the other end of the spectrum, a former gifted commenter wrote, The gifted label has both stigma and expectations. I know there's similar, mostly worse implications for slow or remedial classes, etc., but I was undiagnosed ADHD, depressed, and bored to tears with regular classes. I would have unalived myself by junior year if I hadn't finally had something challenging me. Then again, I didn't learn to really try hard and stick with something until, uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> but that'd probably be the case, label or not. One responder who was in higher level classes, but who wasn't a part of the gifted program and who I personally really resonated with, wrote... I was undiagnosed ADHD most of my life. I've always struggled with school. Not being in the gifted program and navigating undiagnosed neurodivergence really did a number on my self-confidence growing up. A lot of being in advanced classes in high school was me trying to be like my friends who were told that they were talented and gifted since elementary school and attempting to prove to the system that, hey, you were wrong about me actually. It also supports intelligence based only on school, being neurotypical, a specific type of intelligence, and what you can do for society. As another responder put it, smart is also a loaded term, academically inclined is better. And I definitely agree with all of this and I want to talk more about it. Most public schools expect you to sit at a desk for at least five hours a day, excluding one hour for gym and one hour for lunch if you're lucky. So you're in school for a total of seven to eight hours and just sitting still and being quiet is a hard job for a lot of kids, let alone focusing on a subject that they might not care about. Public school is also still very test focused. There are standardized state tests, midterms, finals, the ACTs, the SATs, AP tests, etc. And when school is more focused on memorization, how good you are at taking tests, and how good you are at sitting still and concentrating, then of course most kids are being set up to fail. Specifically kids who can't sit still for long periods of time, have trouble focusing, or are on the opposite end and are too hyper-focused on school and being perfect and made anxious by competition with their peers and pressure from teachers to be perfect, etc. Both ends of the spectrum suffer in their own ways, and setting up school like this isn't sustainable for either party. In the end, gifted students and students who are rewarded by the school system in general are most likely those who can perform in ways that are useful to the state and are again rewarded for a specific type of intelligence. They're also usually the kids who can act in ways the teachers in their lives find desirable. They aim to please and take orders well, which in my opinion doesn't make you gifted or smart or advanced, but just means that you thrive in a school setting and adults like you. But again, in my opinion, that doesn't make anyone more special than anyone else. And this brings me to the next section, part four, what even is giftedness? In this section, I want to go deeper into this idea of what giftedness is as defined by the school system and how we misconstrue natural talent with hard work. So when it comes to identifying giftedness, the National Society for the Gifted and Talented suggests that there are three ways in which giftedness manifests. Firstly, talent. Students can have the raw talent to overperform in one or more domains. The National Association for Gifted Children specifies five domains where children may demonstrate their talent, intellectual, creative, artistic, leadership, and academic domains. Performance. Students should demonstrate the ability to draw upon their raw talent to perform at impressive levels at one or more domains. Comparative. Students should have their performance compared against their peers to reveal whether that performance is significantly better than other students. We're taught to believe that some of us are just born gifted and have raw talent, and with that, we're also taught to believe that everyone's nature is unchanging, when most of the time, that's not true. 
And sure, some kids are predisposed to do well in a school setting. We all have those stories of those truly gifted kids with eidetic memories we went to school with, those kids who could ace every class without trying. This isn't to say that some kids aren't born with special learning capabilities, but most kids who are labeled as gifted are just able to be what teachers in the state want them to be. Quiet, diligent students who don't break the status quo, who are well behaved in the eyes of adults, which again, in my opinion, is different from being special or smart. In reality, being talented and gifted takes a lot of freaking work. It's not something that you're just born with. I think a perfect example of this is when it comes to, you know, the gifted art kids as I was a gifted art kid. As being good at art is seen generally as a skill that some people are just born with and others aren't. You know, it's seen as just this raw talent when that's not true. Sure, some kids are more interested in art than others and spend more time drawing and therefore are able to become good at it from a young age compared to their peers who aren't as interested in the subject and just don't draw slash practice as much. But those naturally talented art kids will only continue to be good at art if they keep at it. Otherwise, they'll just stagnate in ability the same as any other kid. Believing that some people are just born with special capabilities not only overlooks the hard work you know, artists, for example, put in to refine their capabilities and craft because you believe they're just born talented, but it also dissuades other people from even trying to do better at all because they've been told they aren't born with that talent and therefore can't acquire it over time with hard work and dedication. It also discounts all of the help and nurturing and support those already talented kids get. The support that already gifted kids get in school helps them continue to refine their crafts and believe in themselves, while it does the opposite to the anti-gifted kids by not making them believe that they were born special, but also by denying them the same support and resources. In the end, the idea of giftedness, in my opinion, is based on this ridiculous notion that some people are just born with raw talent that can be discerned in elementary school and that those who aren't born with it just don't have it and never will and deserve less because of it. And in the end, that's why I really dislike this idea of gifted students because not only does it kind of lean into this classist, racist, and ableist thinking that intellectual capability is something you're born with, it also helps uphold capitalism by seeing who can produce the most by putting you in competition with others for finite resources, etc. These labels foster a hostile environment, which is the opposite of what school should be. For example, in the Waldorf private schools, they don't give grades and are seen as some of the best private schools in the country for that specific reason. I do understand that most public schools have gifted programs to rightfully foster the kids who could learn at a higher level and faster pace. And though you know that's important, it also unintentionally leaves a lot of kids behind and makes them resentful and angry. Why can't those non-gifted kids get the same nurturing? Maybe if they did, they'd be gifted too. So this part of the video is just going to be audio because for some reason while I was going through my footage, the video clips that I recorded didn't have audio. So let's go. Why can't those non-gifted kids get the same nurturing? Maybe if they did, they'd be gifted too. As one responder put it, I recognize my friends in non-honors would berate themselves slash call themselves stupid in comparison to me and would more often be berated by teachers. I felt like I ended up in the honors class by dumb luck in middle school, definitely not by being quick. So I felt like it was a confidence issue for the other students. No one had told them they were capable, so they felt they weren't. But of course, that's not the way we're brought up to think that everyone can be gifted as long as people support them. And that's by design. Under capitalism, we're taught to believe competition is only natural. And again, resources are finite and not everyone should have access to them. And this brings me to the first question of the survey where I brought up one of the main themes in The Incredibles, which is if everyone's special, then no one is, which most of you, like myself, disagreed with. Like, why is it so bad if no one is innately better than someone else? Why can't we all be special in our own way? But I guess this line of thinking is why this generation is called snowflakes. Ha ha.
As many of you pointed out in your responses, being a part of the gifted program was really important, especially if you were poor or a person of color, specifically black and lower class, because it helped you be taken more seriously academically and open up doors for you that you might not have had access to otherwise. Personally, it was great. Being gifted allowed us to go on special field trips, do creative projects outside of normal coursework, and ultimately get out of normal class. Being a black girl as well, being labeled gifted gave me a ton of privilege in the academic system that I would have otherwise not had. Looking back, I think it was so horrible to split us all up like that. I think of the students in the normal class that would watch the select three or four of us get taken out of class and go do something really cool, i.e. go to a museum or explore our surrounding ecosystem while they did busy work. Academically, being labeled gifted gives you so much power in your academic future. You can take the fun classes in middle school and high school because you took the on-grade level courses you were mandated to take years ago. I didn't have to take math after the 8th grade because we were on such a fast track and were taking high school level courses in middle school. I was able to take more electives and take college level courses giving me credits early. But we all kind of even out when we get older, and that superiority I felt when I was younger vanished, and I felt inferior for a bit. Without some way to distinguish one's perceived mental prowess, you lose your identity. Overall, it was like an ego boost. But being poor, I felt like it was the only way I could escape my situation. We got so many more opportunities. For example, we got to present to the Board of Education as only 11-year-olds. As a black person, I'm lucky to have so many opportunities, but that doesn't make me smarter than someone who couldn't have access to those. Someone isn't slow for not learning the same way that I do. For those who are disadvantaged and on the margins, being labeled gifted and getting those resources and having adults backing you and believing in you is priceless. At the same time, a lot of these same people who were given the gifted label did say they felt inadequate as adults or had a hard time transitioning to college because the label put a lot of pressure on them. But being a gifted kid from a lower income and from a racially marginalized background is something that's so important to talk about because it's unfortunately not the norm. And that's because people from lower incomes with less resources who are food and house insecure have a much harder time focusing on school when their immediate needs aren't being met. And this is a theme in the widely taught children's book and Disney movie, Bridge to Terabithia, where Leslie's a gifted kid because she can afford to be one, while Josh Hutcherson's love of art isn't nurtured by his family not only due to sexism, men don't do art I guess, but because it's a frivolous passion when they're living on the edge of poverty. They're both gifted, but only one of them has the luxury to pursue their gift, and the other has to depend on the kindness of strangers. In the end, being labeled gifted not only comes from how well you can perform in a school setting, but also your class and racial background. Are you already being set up for academic success? And the truth is that most people of color and lower income people are not. In my experience, most of my friends who were mostly Korean American at the time were part of the gifted program and I was one of the only Asian Americans in my grade not accepted and in fact was seen as inferior due to my slow status and the fact that I needed extra help. But because all my friends were in it and they were Asian, I had this need to be part of their world because at the time I believed that would somehow make me more Asian. As being adopted, I was already seen as not Asian enough. Being gifted meant living up to racial stereotypes that at the time I believed were true due to internalized racism. And I did everything I could to be seen as advanced like them. But in reality, these kids were overworked and exhausted from taking on extra classes and homework and tutoring and music lessons, and I soon learned that being naturally gifted was just taking on a lot of extra work and studying for hours on end. This is all to say that being gifted isn't innate in some kids and just not in others, which we've already talked about, but in fact is something that kids work extremely hard at, especially kids of marginalized racial groups and class backgrounds. I don't want to make it seem as though the gifted kids are just all spoiled rich white people because they're not. It's definitely a mixed bag, but in my opinion, the kids most deserving of the label aren't naturally gifted, but again, work their asses off to have a seat at the table and to be recognized by an administration who have already made up their minds about them before they walked in the door. Nowadays, some schools are starting to phase out gifted programs in favor of challenging all students equally, but of course, helping those who may fall behind. More than 30 years ago, Rockville Center began a gradual but determined effort to do away with gifted classes in its elementary schools, as well as many of the tracked classes in middle and high schools. The goal wasn't to eliminate all tracking, Southside Principal John Murphy said. Upperclassmen can still choose to take more challenging math, science, and foreign language classes. It was instead to avoid creating a caste system by assigning students to remedial, average, or advanced classes before they had a chance to develop their academic potential. 
In Rockville Center, track classes also led to racial and economic segregation in a high school where a fifth of the nearly 1,100 students are black or Latino, and the rest of the student body is nearly entirely white. Early on, administrators found that many black and Latino students and students from low-income families avoided the most challenging classes even after being given the option to enroll them. So now, some of the Southside's college-level classes, like Hecker's 12th grade English class, are not only open to all, but also required. Hecker, the English teacher, said he sees that requiring high-level classes does have its cost, but he believes the cost of segregating students based on academic performance is far greater. I think it's better for struggling students to be in my classroom and not in some other room wondering what's going on in those classes where the quote-unquote real learning is happening, he said. I think that is completely demoralizing. Let me know what you think about this down below. To conclude this video, I'll read some of the responses to the survey's bonus question, which was, what should school teach us? Life skills alone yielded 34 results. Here are some more specific answers. Self-esteem, learning how to develop other forms of intelligence, musical, interpersonal, etc. School would have comprehensive sex education, an unbiased history course that covered countries outside of the U.S., and we'd have better, more advanced math starting at a young age like other countries do. Many of my friends who moved to the U.S. told me our math classes were a breeze compared to theirs, and it made me realize how far behind the U.S. it really is. I would love for schools to be much more disability conscious. A huge step towards disability justice would be to stop treating intelligence or executive dysfunction as a moral issue. For example, treating procrastination as laziness versus teaching strategies to overcome the executive dysfunction that leads to procrastination. Art. So much art. Students need art. It's learning about the world around you. It's developing self-concept and view of others. It's motor skills. It's media analysis. Art is so important. Practical real-world skills so I don't feel stranded after leaving school and college. Interpersonal skills so I don't feel like a moron for having to go to group therapy to learn social skills. I love STEM, but these skills are not essential to most people as many other things that are neglected in schools. Financial literacy, critical race theory, more accurate history education, better foreign language programs, some form of rudimentary coding, Excel. Confidence when it comes to learning and wanting to learn new things. Multiple methods of learning, financial literacy and basic life skills, more history including world history. Social skills, money management, automotive care, mental health strategies, horticulture, first aid. And these are all definitely things I also wish school would teach us, rather than just dividing us with labels and hoping for the best. In the end, at least in my opinion, gifted programs are a bunch of BS. Not only is it based on this dangerous notion that some people are just born with raw talent and gifts and other people aren't, and thus implies that our intelligence levels are innate and something unchanging, the people who are labeled as gifted tend to just live up to adults' expectations of how students should behave, act, and be. And though gifted programs and labels benefit those who don't feel challenged enough by their classes and those at the margins who are able to get in, it's still exclusionary. Being called gifted is subjective. It depends on who your teachers are, how well liked you are in school, on whether you're neurotypical or not, how well you're set up for success outside of school, etc. Even though the gifted program prides itself on picking out natural talent and being objective with the use of, again, bogus IQ tests, it is, again, a highly subjective and exclusionary process. In addition, it not only makes the gifted students feel insecure and anxious about their so-called special status and hinders their development and transition to the real world, it also hurts the non-gifted kids, especially the quote-unquote slow kids who learn at a slower pace and need extra help because they internalize the opposite message, that they're born slow and that they can't do well at school and never will. It's such a negative way to be brought up and again pits you against people who should be your friends and peers. In the end, I'm glad I was able to see school from various vantage points because I was able to realize that my self-worth shouldn't and doesn't rely on the labels given to me by an academic institution, but in how I see myself. I thankfully knew that I was smart or more accurately academically inclined. I just learned differently and that's what I want you to know. You may not be gifted in the way school wants you to be, but that doesn't mean that you're any less capable. So thank you for answering my survey and know that your ability to learn, whether it be slower or faster or average, doesn't define your potential. So that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.